I'm Luis Campos. I'm a historian of science at the University of New Mexico. And tonight I'm here at the Science Pub RVA in Richmond, Virginia to talk about life by design, a century of synthetic biology. Cheers! Cheers! Give it up for Dr. Campos. We welcome you. Hello, everyone. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Nature is boring. <laughs> But what if we ignored nature and we began to think about <clears throat> what we could do with biology? If we thought of biology as a kind of technology, could we reconstruct life to suit our purposes? Could we even synthesize it from scratch? So I'm Luis Campos, as you heard, from the University of New Mexico, and I get to spend my days thinking about life as it could be. So I've been following this field of synthetic biology since about 2004, when it first began to emerge with that name. And there's lots of interesting claims. On the wild side, some synthetic biologists have talked about de-extincting woolly mammoths, or the passenger pigeon, creating organisms with the smallest number of genes, or figuring out how to use microbes with uh, space exploration. But the more down-to-earth side of synthetic biology has also begun to emerge to re-engineer metabolisms in order to create new drugs instead of collecting them from endangered species, for instance, or to get biofuels that come from algae. What a great idea that would be. So any technological purpose you can imagine um, that could be served by biology could fall within uh, the, the realm of synthetic biology. So as cool as the future prospects of this field are uh, today, believe it or not, even the future has a history. And so tonight I want to take us on a brief trip back through time. Um, and because even though the technologies themselves might change, the basic idea that we might be able to engineer life and redesign it in ways that exceed nature, that's a claim that goes back uh, at, for over a century. So let's go back to the earliest days then, to California in the 1880s, to Luther Burbank here, the so-called wizard of Santa Rosa. He had this almost magical ability to produce new and valuable things like a white blackberry or a spineless cactus or what he called a, a plum cot, which we now call pluots, uh, half plum and half apricot, um, all sorts of, of new things, even a new kind of daisy that had three parents. Man can go nature one better, he said. He may accomplish in 10 years what nature takes 10 centuries to do. We can improve the vegetable kingdom for the benefit of man. So he sold these new creations, as he called them, in his catalogs. But that very name, new creations, drew criticism. And some raised fears that his newfangled methods of breeding were playing God. According to one critic, Burbank had no more right to claim the title of creator of new plants than he has to apply it to bees that flit from flower to flower and that carry the pollen. Someone else called him a charlatan, a man who was creating all manner of unnatural forms of life, monstrosities. Burbank was even invited to a local church one Sunday to be denounced in the sermon for the better part of an hour <laughs> for, quote, working in direct opposition to the will of God for breeding daisies and white blackberries, and for, quote, creating new forms of life which never should have been created, or if created, only by God himself. He berated me up and down, Burbank remembered. He said the works of nature were plenty good enough as they were. I took a severe drubbing from him. But Burbank stood by his inventions. He said, it's very easy to convince a man who has brains of any ordinary fact, but I've long since found it is of no use to reply to dogs, monkeys, or undeveloped men on these subjects. <laughs> We know that the public liked his new fruits and flowers so much, and he rapidly attained a tremendous level of fame, even drawing European scientists who went all the way to California to meet him. And he was just as famous as the president and as Henry Ford at the time. You could just send a letter, Luther Burbank, comma, California, and it would arrive. So one of those scientists who went all the way to California to uh, meet him was Hugo de Vries, a very famous Dutch botanist. Um, and for any of you who know a little bit about the history of genetics, he was also one of the so-called rediscoverers of Mendel. 
So de Vries ended up not being especially impressed with Burbank's scientific qualities, and he had his own ideas about how to gain control over evolution. Luther Burbank crosses species, I seek to create new ones, he said. So from watching the evening primroses in his garden, and de Vries is the one who came up with the theory of mutation, and that word is his coinage in genetics, mutant and mutation, um, he claimed that a new species could arise suddenly in the space of one generation. So many researchers ended up being very inspired by this theory, and de Vries was invited then in 1904 to inaugurate one especially important new laboratory on the North Shore of Long Island in New York. And in his opening address there, which was called The Aims of Experimental Evolution, he offered a vision of life by design. Evolution has to become an experimental science, he said. It must first be controlled and studied, and then conducted and finally shaped to the use of man. And he thought that the newly discovered x-rays and radioactivity at that time would be important tools to be able to create these new species. Now, there were many researchers who were working here at Cold Spring Harbor at that new laboratory, and this is still one of the major laboratories for molecular biology today. And they began to do just that, using x-rays and radium and other sorts of things. And very quickly, living things that, for a previous generation, had been described as monsters, were now understood to be mutants that could be studied uh, for their prospects, and that could lead to, as one newspaper at the time put it, the modification and improvement of animals and plants at man's will that man could now learn the new role of creator. Other subheaders in the article, which you see here, are, I think, equally revealing of how these matters were thought about in the press in the early 1900s. So researchers here thought they could hurry up evolution. That's how they described it. This business of inventing to order beetles with certain spots, guinea pigs with four toes, goats with waddles, and deaf cats with extra toes, they said, appears upon superficial glance to be useless and silly compared with the increase of the milk quality of a Jersey cow. The enterprise of increasing the annual generation of asparagus bugs will not at first blush appear particularly practical, the newspaper said, especially from the point of view of the farmer but it is from the smallest creatures that the quickest results in the work of learning the laws of heredity can be obtained and which will enable him to mold the animal and vegetable kingdoms to best suit his commercial interests. So these efforts in basic genetics took place side by side with the human-focused interests in the other wing of the same laboratory, the eugenics record office. They had the high hopes that these principles of evolution will show the way to an improvement of the human race mentally, morally, and physically. How, in fact, they said, to create the Superman, that the laws of heredity governing the evolution of the humblest asparagus beetle are practically the same as those, and I have to read this to you, will that will enable science to breed at will a race of big-brained, deep-chested, fleet-limbed, strong-muscled human geniuses with lofty morals, acute senses, and blood highly resistant to the bacilli of disease. So others at the time also dreamed of a technology of the living substance, not through breeding or evolution, but in trying to understand the basics of physiology. For Jacques Lerbe here, trying to understand a phenomenon meant being able to control that phenomenon, um, in doing something with life, and in being able to develop new forms of life at will and as needed. It's possible to get the life phenomena under our control, he said. Such a control and nothing else is the aim of biology. Now, for Lerb, the ultimate idea of control over life meant not only you could do with it as you willed, but you would also eventually be able to create it in the test tube from scratch. So his dream, he said, was to see what he called a constructive or an engineering biology in the place of one that was merely analytical, life by design. He was most famous for his 1899 experiments with sea urchins. That's what you see at the top there by changing the concentration of salt in a solution surrounding a sea urchin egg, he was able to cause the further development of the embryo without fertilization. So the next generation came into existence without a father. This remarkable discovery, which was called almost the manufacture of life in the laboratory, was, uh, meant that we had drawn, he said, a great step nearer to the chemical theory of life that we may see ahead of us the day when a scientist experimenting with chemicals in his test tube may see them unite and form a substance which shall live and move and reproduce itself. <laughs>
He almost got the Nobel Prize for this in 1901 for what was called artificial parthenogenesis. But the archives also contain a concerned letter from two young unmarried women who wrote to ask him, in light of his work on fatherless sea urchins, if he thought it was still safe for them to bathe in the sea or whether they were running the risk of becoming pregnant. <laughs> So throughout the early 20th century then, this idea that scientists could re-engineer living things was a widespread goal. And these efforts began to turn into what was being called genetic engineering as early as the 1930s. In my first book, Radium and the Secret of Life, I've written about how the fruit fly geneticist, Herman J. Muller, in 1927 did some remarkable work with x-rays and using ionizing radiation to create mutations in fruit flies, thousands of mutations that had never been seen before. And he figured out that radiations cause mutations and they alter our heredity by, by changing our genes. This was work for which he later received the Nobel Prize and which became especially important during the atomic age. He did that work in 1927 and got the Nobel Prize in 1946. When it comes to the agricultural significance of this early synthetic biology though, it's worth saying a bit more about those who work on plants. So another researcher who used radiation at this time to produce mutants in the Jimson weed in Datura here, which many of you may have in your gardens, was Albert Blakesley, and he was the second director of that same laboratory of Cold Spring Harbor. He found in his experiments that he could get mutants, he said, that were so strikingly different in their character from normal plants that it seemed as if they had been made up to order with a definite plan and purpose. So his approach enabled him not only to characterize, but to predict and to create new types of species based on patterns of chromosomal rearrangement. This was evolution to order, and that's how it got referred to at the time. But he said, juggling chromosomes for the betterment of plant kind is primarily a matter for the trained genetics engineer who knows the chromosomes with which he's working. And so that's the first use that I found of the phrase genetic engineering, and it dates all the way back to the 1930s. Blakesley and others were particularly interested in how using chemicals also, like colchicine, which comes from the autumn crocus, could double sets of chromosomes in plants and that that could produce new species. They would look different in some cases than the ones that they came from. Or that doubling chromosomes would permit the crossing of species that otherwise wouldn't be able to breed together, even vegetables from different genera. So there's great promise in these sorts of methods. So here is one science magazine showing at the time a, a newly synthesized radage, or is it cabbage? And at the bottom it, it calls them weird combinations of characters made possible basically by breeding together a radish and a cabbage, both of which had had their sets of chromosomes doubled. So Blakesley became an expert in using colchicine to create new kinds of mutants and new kinds of, of flowers and uh, larger and better things, and he began to popularize this technique. By the 1940s and the 1950s, an entire realm of amateur backyard biology had emerged with people trying to create new mutant flowers in their own gardens using colchicine. So this was a mid-century horticultural predecessor of things you might hear about today of do-it-yourself biohackers. With the discovery of the structure of DNA in 1953, with a better understanding of the gene, and with the rise of molecular biology, there are other new frontiers for the engineering of life that began to emerge here. By the 1960s, the possibility of crossing species barriers of what was called mating the unmatable and stitching together pieces of DNA that would never be found together in nature and that you could never get together in your garden, that became a new and tantalizingly real prospect for lots of folks. One grad student at Stanford at the time said, usually scientists do experiments that are useful for other scientists, but this would be one of the few times a scientist really had an opportunity to do something for the general public. It meant you could do anything with the genes of any organism. The potential for affecting agriculture and medicine was obvious to us. By the late 60s and the early 70s, the impact of these imminent new biological techniques was already being debated and discussed. Some began to wonder whether the endless quest for more knowledge was always a good thing. For all the wonderful new things that the engineering of life could produce, for those who had grown up in the shadow of the atomic age, there were also larger concerns about the potential peril of some new scientific discoveries. So while an earlier generation had adopted these new engineering technologies of life wholeheartedly, for some in the 60s and the 70s, the question of science's positive impact on the world was an important one to consider, especially when it came to new technologies designed to control and recombine DNA in new ways. <clears throat> 
One piece in the top medical journal, The Lancet, noted in 1966, it's a hard thing for an experimental scientist to accept, but it's becoming all too evident that there are dangers in knowing what should not be known. Another editorial in the science, news, uh, science journal Nature from 1969 was entitled, On Which Side Are the Angels? And one three years later was called A Two-Edged Sword. So for many at the time, even the very phrase genetic engineering meant to their ears eugenics, something to do with the improvement of people, of creating supermen rather than animals and plants. And while that idea might have been a welcome one in 1900, eugenics was a much more complicated idea in the decades after World War II. Others were worried about the potential of cutting and pasting segments of DNA from one species to another for biological warfare. And there were concerns about ecological and evolutionary effects. One proponent said, we can merge the genes of most diverse origin, from plant or insect, from fungus or man as we wish. We are becoming creators, makers of new forms of life, creations that we cannot undo, that will live on long after us, that will evolve according to their own destiny. What are the responsibilities of creators for our creations and for all the living world into which we bring our inventions? Another distinguished critic asked about the wisdom of violating species boundaries. Have we the right, he said, to counteract irreversibly the evolutionary wisdom of millions of years in order to satisfy the ambitions and the curiosity of a few scientists? Others put their concerns more bluntly. Was recombinant DNA potentially dangerous or even hazardous to human health? In a series of letters in the early 1970s, some of the leading biologists in the field raised these concerns about what they called potential biohazards in communications among themselves as safety considerations. If you re-engineer bacteria in the laboratory that are also found in the human gut, then how do you make sure that they don't escape from the laboratory? Are there some kinds of experiments, like those using some kinds of cancer-causing viruses, that simply shouldn't be done because they're too risky? These were the questions at the time. So these open letters culminated in 1975 when many of these um, participants gathered at the Asilomar Conference Center, a former religious retreat center on the beautiful coast near Monterey, California, to discuss the potential biosafety concerns and what should happen as the field moved forward. One journalist who was in attendance and who wrote what is by far the best account of this meeting is this one here, the Pandora's Box Congress, which was published in Rolling Stone magazine. So how appropriate for this venue tonight, right? <laughs> His description, debating the ethics of human interference with the mechanics of evolution in a church at the edge of the immense saline test tube where it all started. <laughs> Rarely does one find one's metaphors so cheap or so apt. <laughs> over the space of the next few days, he wrote over beer, sitting in the chapel, next to the ocean, huddled around a forbidden tree, they struggled to define the issues and the best path forward with this promising but potentially hazardous new technology, he said, trying to create some new commandments with no goddamn Moses in sight. <laughs> so <clears throat> the end result was uh, a temporary moratorium on certain kinds of especially potentially dangerous research. No demonstrated danger, but potential was the concern. And the creation that also came out of this meeting of some guiding principles for laboratory design and for precautionary practice that remain with us to this day, from containment to discussions of biological safety levels and how we design our laboratories for different kinds of work. But ironically, that very meeting was just the beginning of a much larger public discussion about the potentials and perils of this particular new kind of synthetic biology. As it happens, however, many of these biologists' particular fears about genetic engineering dissipated very rapidly as these techniques became widely adopted and used without incident, and that became central to the rise of the biotech industry in the 1980s, creating markets worth billions of dollars. By 2004, then, a new generation had emerged calling themselves synthetic biologists, and they presented still another vision for the future of biology and for creating life by design. Coming at first from everything but biology, from civil engineering, from electrical engineering, from computer science, and from internet design, uh, inventors of the TCP IP protocol, um, these early synthetic biologists looked at those recombinant DNA uh, technique um, issues from the 1970s and the 1980s, and they looked at the rise of this entire industry that was based on those techniques, and they didn't recognize anything that was there being called genetic engineering as any engineering that they were familiar with. 
Failure rates were high, your success depended on statistical outcomes, and there was no sense, they thought, of standardization or of modularity or any of the other features of good engineering design. What others had long called genetic engineering, they called now just breeding. So this new generation said they wanted to draw on insights from engineering, from computer science, to find ways to fully design living systems according to these principles of modularity, of prediction, of control, of standardization, of using what they called an abstraction hierarchy that conceived of living things as being composed of parts that made up devices, that made up larger systems. They advocated what they called biological simplicity, or in other words, biological disenchantment is another term they used that you could take modular pieces of DNA, you'd call them biobricks, and you'd be able to plug and play them like Legos, that you could potentially mix and match any function that you would want to be able to biologically encode. So one example that I heard was to make bacteria that glowed in the dark when they detected a chemical in a landmine. Just wait until nighttime, spray them over the field, and then look and see where the landmines are. The bacteria would glow in the dark. So these synthetic biologists wanted to make biology easier to engineer, and they wanted to take advantage of new advances in DNA synthesis technologies, and also incredible reductions in the price of artificially synthesizing genes from chemicals off the shelf. DNA is a programming language for cells, one of them said. In the past, we did genetic engineering by cutting out the molecules and splicing them together, which is very slow, like writing a ransom note by cutting and pasting letters on the page. But now we're at the stage where we can synthesize DNA by machines, and it's like using a word processor. Today, he said, if you can type, you can be a genetic engineer. So some synthetic biologists had a vision at first also of an open source biology, that they would reinvent the rules of intellectual property and create a shared open platform for industrial innovation. So contemporary synthetic biology in its earliest years was frequently presented to audiences as novel, as revolutionary, and as cool, as you see on the right here. Biology was going to be rethought for the first time from foundational design principles. And a massive following quickly developed, especially among some very energetic and ingenious undergraduates who created and began to participate in what was called the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition, iGEM. This started out with four teams in 2004. They had over 165 teams by 2011 with over 1,000 participants. And the prize was a big, shiny, brick-sized Lego. So every conference in this field has seen more and more people attending and some people even being turned away. The very first conference had six weeks notice and room for 150 people, over 500 people wanted to come. There was also the increasing emergence of um, some civil society groups that wrote letters of concern about what they viewed as uh, a Silomar 2.0 is what they called it, that 1975 meeting, they referred back to it. That there was a lack of public oversight, they felt, of these new biotechnologies. That there could be unjust or disparate economic impacts of how this might be playing out. And some recurring echoes of playing God. The cover of their report, which is called Extreme Genetic Engineering, has the Michelangelo uh, fresco of the creation of Adam and Adam and God, and uh, Adam is making a double helix out of uh, what look like Legos, and God's finger is like this. So. <laughs> but obviously the field was very successful in creating an ethos of coolness, and they even designed this comic book, which was published, as you see there, in the journal Nature. I think that's probably the first and only time a comic book has appeared in the journal Nature. So I've attended each of these synthetic biology conferences since 2004, and next month I'll be going to Singapore for the seventh one in the series to follow the cutting edge of life as it could be today. And synthetic biology is no longer just a dream, but a discipline. There are academic positions, there's commercial companies, there's venture capital, there's federal funding, there's attention from experts in governance and civil society alike. And just what counts as synthetic biology continues to develop here, whether it's a standardized parts-based approach that you've heard me describe, or the construction of minimal genomes or minimal cells, or metabolic engineering, or studying the origins of life, the meaning of synthetic biology continues to expand. And the meaning of what it means to engineer life continues to expand. It now could also include things like the creation of entirely synthetic genomes or synthetic orthogonal biochemistries that don't interact with natural ones. You could create living systems that have no intersection with natural ones. There's no technical barrier to synthesizing plants and animals, one proponent said. It'll happen as soon as somebody wants to pay for it. And that idea, 
that we can engineer new forms of life at will and limited only by our ingenuity and from our, the money that we have available for it, that idea takes us right back to Luther Burbank from a century ago. So how does this history of life as it could be matter for those of us who are interested in the future of synthetic biology and what might happen, right? So here are my final thoughts on this all. We always have a tendency to think that we are living on the cusp of the new, right? On the cutting edge. And it's true, our current technologies are really quite remarkable. But what looking at a larger history at the century of synthetic biology does is it helps us to see that even if the technologies change, the vision is surprisingly constant over time. Now that's not to say that history repeats itself. That's never the case. As the novelist Julian Barnes once said, no, history just burps. And we taste again that raw onion sandwich it swallowed <laughs> centuries ago. But the idea that basic research is important and that tantalizing practical and commercial benefits are just around the corner and that there's a larger social world to consider, these are some of the constants that we've seen in this little history of synthetic biology. As I said in the beginning, even the future has a history. But we've also seen that things change over time and that something that sounds good at one moment in time may be problematic at another. And what that means is that the deep questions don't have easy answers. What are the pro proper limits of what we should do? When are we breeding daisies and when are we playing God? When are we improving human heredity and when are we creating supermen? And when is that a good thing, like in 1900? And when is that a dangerous thing, like in 1970? And we've also seen that the particular context of the time that you live in matters. For people living in the atomic age with the prospect of nuclear war, the idea that more knowledge always led to a better future was not necessarily a given. If scientists might inadvertently release a biological bomb, well then there was good reason to stop and to think first. What were the other evolutionary or ecological or public health consequences of our attempts to redesign life? And of course the pressing question for us today might equally well be, what are the risks of not doing something and of standing still? After all, biology is the best technology that we have for making stuff, right? So there aren't easy answers to these questions about the future of synthetic biology, and the ways that we respond are always going to reflect our time. But that's why I love the history of science. Nature may be boring, but history definitely isn't. And it's always best discussed over a drink. So thank you all. Uh, I'm really surprised that you think nature is boring. <laughs> I think nature is wonderful, but for people who are interested in engineering nature over this time, what they say over and over again is that it's, what they can do with it is what they're interested in. Uh, ah, yeah. but there's been four and a half billion years of a system that has worked with inputs and outputs, and we still only know a little bit about DNA. And so I'm a little wary of cutting and pasting mm -hmm. into a system that's had so long to interact on a particular environment um, that's been a feedback system. Yep. And so I'm still cautious. Yeah. I, I remember synthetic organic molecules and they kind of didn't fit quite the way we thought they would. So. Um, I think precautionary principles still should be very much in the forefront. And so thank you so much for that comment. That is a, a very important position and it's one that, um, that I think emerges quite strongly after the middle part of the century. We don't have those sorts of arguments um, appearing in the early part of this history. The idea was that somehow our ingenuity would solve all of our problems. There's great hope in, in what we might be able to do in using nature as a resource. I think um, things changed rather dramatically and we can tie that to um, a larger um, crisis of, of trust and authority. We can tie that to uh, movements of the 60s, to the environmental movement, to a lot of things, the precautionary principle as an idea that emerges also at that time in the 1970s. And it's also informed how some biologists have responded to the synthetic biologists. I told you that they were generally not from biology. And that's why that view is not one that most biologists share. Biologists find nature fascinating and endlessly complex in biology especially. It's, complexity is the name of the game in biology. And, and these synthetic biologists felt, and they were, having a hard time at first convincing biologists of this particular approach. For one, biologists thought this wouldn't work. 
that biology could never be boiled down to Lego bricks that could be added together with different functions to do something. I mean, that just never happens. Um, and even in some of the earliest work that they were doing of refactoring the T7 phage and other sorts of things, um, they would design a system and then the, the organism would evolve away from what they had intended, even though they were trying to use that system as a model to explain how this new synthetic future could be something that, that could be done. So I think your comment is an is a important one and certainly reflects how a lot of people feel. And I think it's especially relevant for the ways in which synthetic biologists didn't come out of biology and tried to bring things that made sense to them from their engineering background to something that they just saw as messy and as breeding. And what that means is that the, the exact things that biologists find so interesting are the things that are noise for some of the synthetic biologists. I guess uh, I'm kind of interested, the, the excellent talk, and uh, I'm kind of curious, uh, in the early 2000s, there were some people that kind of set themselves apart on the complete opposite side of the comment that just went on and like really dropped the utilitarian side of this synthetic biology and really going towards the aesthetic side of this synthetic biology. So people like Adam Zaretsky is a name that I'm familiar with in like bio artistry. And I'm just curious if you could speak to the use of synthetic biology for something like body modification and where that might go in the future. Um, you know, and like what, yeah, I can already hear people are kind of weirded out by that. And that's, and that's exactly true, you know, that's exactly right. Like, I mean, like, you know, people with houndstooth, you know, skin instead of regular skin and, and where you see that in the breadth of it as a scientific field. Yeah. And stand uh, over here, okay, great. Um, that is also a, a very interesting question. I don't think I know the first thing about body mod, but um, <clears throat> there is a, a really interesting way that synthetic biology has begun to um, connect itself with designers and with artists and with bio art more generally. There's a project called Synthetic Aesthetics that was started a number of years ago where they had uh, artists who would be resident in scientific laboratories and working with the scientists and generating their own artistic practice out of it, which I think is a really interesting thing. They produced a book out of that that came recently um, called Synthetic Aesthetics as well. There is a, um, a much larger history one could connect to of, um, of what kind of go under the label of transhumanist ideas about how we might need to redesign human bodies for new futures or for new environments. Certainly when that came to thinking about humans getting off the earth and going to far off places in the universe and how long that would take and how humans would need to uh, evolve or be modified differently, those ideas we can trace back a very long time. J.D. Bernal in the 1930s, the world, the flesh, and the devil, he already has these sorts of ideas that are there. So the implications of um, things that we do with animals and plants for humans is something that has always been there from the very beginning. And and in the early days, it was called eugenics. By the middle of the century, it might have had another name. Nowadays, I think people who are interested in any possible way of reconceiving what counts as the human might turn to this as another sort of mechanism for doing that. Um, but it's an interesting question. What areas of research are receiving the most funding and from whom? Oh, that's a good Money. question. Money. <laughs> that's a good question. Um, it had begun with some money that was coming from um, private sources. Uh, it, the Department of Energy then got very interested in it. Um, and DARPA has also gotten more interested in more, more recent time, the uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. But a number of different parts of the government have begun to, to find interest in it and to fund it. There have been hearings. Um, and it's been a major push, actually, by many of the, the top synthetic biologists to try and get the government into it, because that's what they saw would be necessary to create a new industry where uh, redesigning life in this way would be something that could become a whole new realm of endeavor rather than just one-off mm -hmm. sorts of things or um, kooky sorts of ideas like de-extincting a mammoth. So yeah, the specific numbers I'm not aware of. Over here. Over there. Okay. Hi. Yes. Are right. you familiar with any work that's being done on reverse engineering, taking from the animate to the inanimate back to the animate? Adding and subtracting chromosomes at which point the organism no longer lives, and then adding the chromosome back. So that is a general technique to find out what you need as a basic part of your system. Um, and so, for instance, the minimal genome work is one example of that. What genes do you actually need to run this organism and which ones can you get rid of? And so Venter's lab, Craig Venter, had done a lot of work trying to get the m kind of most basic, most fundamental form of life that he could get at. Um, Blakesley had been doing that back in the 30s. What happens when you have an extra chromosome or you have different combinations of things and how would that produce a 
difference in the phenotype. And is so, this in plants? That's, that's in plants, yeah. So, so the recent examples that I'm aware of are people like Venter, but I think that's a general technique that's useful to know what is the difference in the system, right? If you take this out and you put that in. Um, but maybe you're thinking of something more specific. Of life itself, of what counts as a living system. At what point is it adamant? At what point is it living, reproducible? You remove a gene, it no longer lives. You potentially add that gene back, and it's animated again. And it works again. Uh, something in the same organism, you're saying? In the same organism, right. I've heard some work about worms, very simple, where they take the genes out and then find it no longer is a living organism, can't reproduce, mm -hmm. but then adding the genes back does not bring it back to Into it. the same organism, or they've, they've created other? Same, same organism. Interesting, okay, we should talk more. Yeah, yeah. that sounds very I Frankenstein. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pipe Where's it right here. Where's my switch? <laughs> Hi, my name is Luce, like right. Goose, um, and I, um, I don't know how to ask this, but it is, um, genetically modified foods and hormone chicken making me fat. Um, more like, um, is it, uh, how does it affect, how do, the, how, how does the agriculture and everything that we're consuming that's been modified affect our bodies and the way historically we have been and where we're going? I think that's also a great question and one that I'm not qualified to answer. Oh, no. <laughs> but um, what I can point to is, um, how different these sorts of discussions look in different places. So if we look at, for instance, the American attitude to GMOs and the European attitude, there's quite a difference there of things that are allowed in this country that are completely forbidden somewhere else. Um, that comic book that I showed you, um, there's a, a part of it where the student is named after figures in the Big Lebowski, so it's Sally and Dude. Um, and so Dude forgets to put a regulator into his bacterium and it continues to produce more gas and it gets bigger and bigger and then explodes all over the place. And he's like, oh, I guess I should have learned to put my... And she's like, gee, you think? And so this is a comic book that's intended to introduce American students to um, these ideas of synthetic biology, and, and that's a very American story. Oh, you, you tried, and it didn't work, so try again. They translated this comic book into German um, for the Swiss audience, and it just didn't work in Switzerland. They, you put a child in charge of these experiments, <laughs> and they messed up? Like, what were you thinking, right? And so I think the, the, the national or the cultural context of exactly these sorts of questions are really interesting, that people might have different answers to them in, in different places. There's a historical way to get at that, at that, which is in addition to a scientific way. So. Hi, my name is Arthur. Has anybody proposed I'm the sorry, idea? sorry, I don't see you. Oh, Where am I looking? Oh, yeah, oh, there. Okay. Sorry. Okay. How are you doing? <laughs> the lights are very bright here. Okay. My name's Arthur. Uh, has anybody proposed the idea that this is a good reason to start a large space, compartmented space station community or city for doing this so that if something goes out of hand, it can be jettisoned to the sun and we're not <laughs> endangering the planet? I mean, look what we did with bees. We take them from Africa, we bring them to South America, now we've got a problem there. Yeah. To do this someplace where it's contained and can be jettisoned off and destroyed mm -hmm. would make a good idea and it'd be a good reason to step out into space where we're not just going into forever land, we're going someplace right there and doing something for the planet. Yeah. Yeah, not in my backyard, <laughs> not in my planet. Right. And that's what's so interesting because in the 50s you would want to do it in your backyard. You would go get that chemical and put it in your spray bottle and put it on your flowers and hope that you produced a new and interesting kind of flower is exactly the point. So something changed from that earlier story to now where I don't want it in my, in my backyard. Something changed where it was, it was interesting and, and hopeful and promising to do this to know we need to be concerned about it. But then something changed again. So in the 70s when they first start talking about we need to design laboratories very carefully, we need to produce containment mechanisms and procedures and have different levels of safety for different sorts of things we're working on, they were very clear, no, 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 no student will ever be involved in doing this kind of work. But something changed, right? You can get your iGEM brick if you win the competition, if you're an undergraduate or even a high school student who's doing these things. That now using student ingenuity before they've been, as they said, brainwashed into um, other ways of thinking, they get their creativity of, 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 for the students to think about what sorts of things might be biologically possible and to have them do it. That is again a change then from the 70s where you wouldn't want to have the students do it. And there's also a shift from the idea of keeping this in the laboratory where it's safe and where it's contained 
into the idea, well, the whole point is to develop something in some cases that could be deployed, that could be put out there in the environment in order to have a, a useful impact on the world. And how do you make sure that thing you put out in the environment then doesn't produce untoward ecological consequences, right? And so how could you design organisms that have what they call a kill switch or some sort of fail-safe way that um, you could turn them off at a certain point, that they wouldn't just take over everywhere out there, but they could still go out there and do what you want them to do. So I think the, the approaches that synthetic biologists are trying to come up with now are also taking those safety considerations, which could include ecological or public health considerations, into account. How can we make sure these things can't live outside the laboratory for very long, that they require some special nutrient, or that we design other sorts of, of uh, kill switches into them? I haven't heard the idea of doing this work up on uh, space stations, although there are synthetic biologists who are interested in how they could use synthetic biology technologies to do things in space space, that if the time comes to uh, escape the planet for some reason, that we'd be able to um, take those technologies with us to other places, whether creating bricks out of the, um, the regolith on Mars or um, how it might be to, to have our self-contained systems for human survival in outer space. So I immediately thought of mosquitoes, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So does anyone want to, anyone, who's, who's really knowledgeable in this room about mosquitoes and the idea of releasing them? Okay. Oh, okay. Hey, so um, my name is Elliot. I am a self-taught synthetic biologist. I run an independent lab in town that's in a garage and we do synthetic biology. And I think of synthetic biology no more as baking or uh, gardening. It's just another tool that you can use in order to interact with the world. And I know just as well as you guys that uh, I killed a cactus when I was trying to take care of it. So it's really hard to actually end up doing anything. Um, but at the same point, it's just another tool in, in the repository of ways of interacting with the world in, in my mindset. And so to your point on the mosquitoes, there's um, some new techniques that have come out in synthetic biology in Kevin Asfeld's lab in the MIT Media Lab. Yeah. And they've created something called the gene drive, which is a modified CRISPR system that can push a specific gene uh, selectively through a given population of mosquitoes. And so that means that over the course of successive generations, they can breed out malaria in all mosquitoes everywhere. And while this may be really promising on one hand, it's also really dangerous on the other hand, because at the same point, you can selectively breed any kind of gene through a given population. And so just like any technology, it's a double-edged sword. And so my motivation with my lab is to introduce people to synthetic biology and just have them more familiar with it. So my question to you Can is, I just say real quick on, sure. on that comment that Kevin also has done some really um, wonderful talks on, on what he's doing and he talks a lot about how he works with the communities that he wants to introduce these engineered mosquitoes into to get their buy-in before he does it. Yeah. So I think that's a, an interesting lesson from the 70s from how do you take this interesting scientific work or engineering work and relate it to the world where you want to make your difference. Cool. Yeah, he's also bred in like a selected filters so that over successive generations it has a limited effect. So, so he, they are working on controls and everything is contained within the lab before release as well. All right, Elliot, we're ready for your quick question. Okay, <laughs> so my question is, what is the role of these like do-it-yourself independent biology labs uh, to educating the community to interacting with synthetic biology? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a question for, for you more than anything else, right? That's <laughs> <laughs> Well, what I, what I think is really interesting is that um, uh, from very early on, this field portrayed itself, as I said, new and revolutionary and cool and all these sorts of, and, and hacking biology was the, the interesting thing. Now, the word hack meant a good thing at MIT, but for a lot of the people, that first meeting to hack something wasn't necessarily a good thing. Why would you want to hack biology? That sounded very strange. Or when people said, we want to develop a killer app for something. Well, that language works in Silicon Valley, but when you're talking about biology, people hear killer app, and they're, no, 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 we should name that the, the Cure My Grandmother app. That was, uh, that was a literal quote that came from there. So, um, so the idea of, um, of being something that should be open for everyone, that should be cool, should be something you do at an event like this was there from the very beginning of synthetic biology. What happened a few years after that was the FBI got interested. 
and they wanted to know who are these do-it-yourself biologists who are self-trained and modifying life and doing it in their garages and their kitchens with no controls or no regulations. They're not even aware these things exist. And, and how do we know what their intent is? And how do we make sure that we don't have, and there's a little diagram I saw of the honorable researcher, and, and then it kind of goes down the scale of dishonorability, and it ended up with bin Laden genetics at the end. <laughs> And that was that reflects the time in which that chart had been drawn, right? And so, what you know, how does how does one uh, permit the broad democratization of a field? And that language was used a lot to get as many people involved as possible, while still holding to other sorts of regulations and, and concerns um, that we want to make sure are, are followed. So, what I think is interesting is that while at the beginning the field described itself as uh, revolutionary and cool and new, and anybody can do it and join in and democratize it, um, what started to happen was no, 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 we're not revolutionary. This is familiar familiar technologies that we've used for many decades already, and this is a form of public outreach and of public education to bring people in to do these DIY labs. And I think that is the emergence of those labs um, has had different uh, valences and registers over time. It's meant different things um, as the last decade has gone by. So I think now it's much more of what you're saying of, of education, of outreach. These are interesting techniques for everybody to learn about biology with. Hi. Hi. I'm Virginia from Virginia. <laughs> uh, Referring to your comment uh, a few minutes ago about the kill switch and containment mm -hmm. brings to mind the HeLa cell. Uh, that's not synthetic. Uh, how is that being used or how does that relate now to synthetic? So HeLa cells are um, from the woman Henrietta Lacks from a cancer that she had many years ago. They've become a major cell line that is used for research um, today. And it's been in the news quite a bit because of, uh, of uh, the story of these cells and, and um, the ways in which her family felt they didn't get the compensation that they were owed from these being cells that came from their mother or their grandmother's body. So you may have heard um, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks was a famous book that came out recently that told this story. So those cells are a basic cell line that would be um, used in, in lots of different forms. Of, um, of biological research. What I, another way that I might um, try to address your question is that the, the concern behind that is how do we know that these new technologies are, um, are carrying the ethical standard that we want them to carry, that we're, we're using cells in an appropriate way or that whatever we develop is going to be deployed in ways that are equitable and fair. Those are the sorts of concerns that came up from the civil society group, what they called themselves the et cetera group, ETC. That they, they said, if you start to create you know, synthetic vanilla or other sorts of things, then vanilla farmers are going to be out of jobs. If you start to create biofuels from um, sugar cane, well, then you're going to have large sugar cane plantations that are replacing the rainforest in Brazil. That there are other ways in which as you're developing interesting new biological solutions for problems of the real world, there are large complicated effects in the economies that we exist in, and that those things also need to be considered as part of how synthetic biology advances, that those aren't just extraneous social things that get solved at some later point. So that question of what counts as being part of synthetic biology and what counts as being just the larger context is one that the community itself has struggled with over the years of who is part of that conversation and how do we make sure that some new technology that we develop has the implications that we want it to have. So um, my name is Alan, by the way. So I'm hearing all this about these kill switches in case I guess one of these experiments goes haywire or something. And I hear from there about um, some sort of possibility of modifying human beings. How do you think our society is going to take to putting kill switches in modified human beings? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the function of the kill switch is to make us confident that we have control over the living things that we're releasing, right? The goal is to make sure that we, um, we have studied and understand what the potential impacts might be and that we can end the experiment when we want to. And that's especially important with technologies that we're deploying into, into the real world. So, yeah. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Appreciate it.